Brave New Conversations is funded by subscribers like you. Well, joining us live from Paris now is Jude Finstera. He's a spokesman for Dow Chemicals. Today, I'm very happy to announce that for the first time, Dow is accepting full responsibility for the Bhopal catastrophe. This interview was inaccurate. The hoax was an elaborate one. The prank knocked 3% off Dow shares. Well, I wouldn't say it's a hoax. It's an honest representation of what Dow should be doing. <laughs> So we have Andy Bickelbaum from the Yes Men. Um, we're very excited to have him here. Um, I wanted to start the conversation with this incredible image um, of the Survivor Ball, uh, which is featured prominently in the movie. And uh, if you've been seeing the news lately, you've been seeing it kind of pop up all over the country. Uh, just yesterday, a bunch of Survivor Balls went chasing Senator Specter down uh, a, a pathway in DC. Um, not long ago, they were at Whole Foods and all kinds of stuff. But um, where did an idea like this first come about? I mean, uh, you and your cohorts just sit around, come up with the most astonishing ideas. Stupid. <laughs> um, it's, it's basically the stupidest uh, costume we could imagine. And we just tried to think stupid and embody it. And it's kind of a stand-in for what, what not doing anything about the climate looks like. Um, it's a device to save corporate managers if climate catastrophe is as bad as scientists say it will be if we don't do anything. <laughs> Um, we presented it at a Halliburton, at, as Halliburton at a, a conference in Florida, the Gulf Coast, the devastated Gulf Coast. It was a, an insurance conference. And we, we basically said, this will save corporate managers if things go haywire. That disaster can be an opportunity as long as you survive it. And this is the way to do that. Mm. They and just bought it. It, it was yeah. priced, uh, I would imagine, a little bit above what regular folk could afford, yeah? That was one of the questions from the audience, yeah, was the, the price. And uh, you see this conversation with one of the, the lawyers who, who actually spoke on the panel with, with us. And he said, um, yeah, you know, I guess it's, it's too expensive for most people, but people who really need it will be able to afford it. <laughs> Um, well, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, pretty much everybody has heard of many of the different hoaxes that you've pulled and pranks that you've pulled, but mm. not many people know how you actually got started doing this kind of work. What was the original inspiration to make you want to start doing this? And I know that you guys first started with, with website construction and just kind of seeing what would happen from there. How did that start? Yeah, it was um, in November of 99. Uh, familiar date for a lot of us. Um, it was uh, about two weeks before the Seattle protests against the WTO. Um, we knew it was going to be historic and important, and we also knew that we couldn't make it. So we were playing around with websites at the time. The web was kind of new and copying websites and seeing what we could do with that. So we decided to copy the WTO's website, um, make a website that was more truthful and more transparent, and put it up and see what happened. And so uh, did that. And, and really, we, we just thought it would be a kind of commentary on the WTO. People would laugh. You know, that would be it. But actually, um, we, we started getting a lot of email for the WTO, including an invitation to a conference at one point. And when that happened, it took us about a month to figure out what to do about it. We just kind of sat on it, paralyzed, and then finally realized we could go. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> what, what was the outcome of the first appearance that you made? It was, um, it was uh, decidedly anticlimactic. We, we uh, prepared for a big confrontation, took a camera, uh, flew to Austria. It was a law conference in Salzburg, Austria, and uh, that, that in itself kind of spooked us. And. Um, went there as the WTO to this law conference and told them that the, what we were advocating um, was the 
complete privatization of democracy <laughs> and the selling of votes, of citizen votes directly to corporations <laughs> instead of going through this elaborate campaign finance thing. Um, and we had a, an actual diagram on the screen showing the normal campaign finance thing where you pay the, you know, the corporation pays the campaign, who pays the public relations agency, et cetera, just buy the vote. And um, people just sat there and, you know, asked polite questions at the end. We had lunch with them. Uh, it's, and we were faced with the task of, like, making something coherent out of this. Um, so we ended up with this convoluted 25-minute video that kind of describes what happened. And it's, it's fun, but um, then when we kept getting invitations to conferences, we realized we had to up the ante, come up with costumes, uh, get some filmmakers on board, and that's how the first movie, The Yes Men, happened. Right. And, and in this movie, you talk about, uh, I mean, I think it's after the survivable scene that you talk about um, upping the ante continuously because people actually bought that. And, and it yeah. seems like a challenge that you're continuously facing. Yeah, yeah. Figuring out you know, what's effective and what can actually create any kind of change um, is, is, yeah, it's a continuous question. So like with, uh, with that, I mean, you know, that's, that's for the plot of the movie, of course. In reality, it didn't quite happen exactly that way. Um, but yeah, we, we did the Halliburton conference and people just bought the survivable. So then we thought, well, what do we really want to do? Um, they, didn't, they couldn't afford them, but they, they bought the idea of the survivables. And we thought, what, what could we do? Um, to actually propose, you know, to, to show people that things can be better, to, to have a more positive message instead of just dupe people into buying a, a really horrible solution. And so we got ourselves invited to the, this conference in New Orleans um, a year after Katrina and found ourselves alongside uh, Mayor Nagan and Governor Blanco on a podium uh, in front of a thousand contractors. And it really was unexpected. We, had, we, we intended, like we promised them the uh, head of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, um, and they gleefully told the mayor's office and the governor's office about that, even though we told them to, we swore them to secrecy. They told the mayor and the governor and they showed up to rub shoulders with the head of HUD, who of course didn't show up. But, but it was me and they were pleasant. So at that, um, you talked about um, a low-income housing um, complex that had been closed after the hurricane, that had not been damaged during the hurricane. Um, and so families whose homes had survived were still being kicked out of their homes. And mm -hmm. you talked about how HUD was going to reverse their policy and reopen those. Um, to the expense of these contractors who were in the audience who were looking to build new places, but they were applauding the decision and were incredibly happy about that. And yeah. so it, it, it seems to show the base of, of an, an element of human nature that really actually appreciates when corporations and organizations and governments do good. But we have such a hard time following up on that. Is that does that get frustrating for you after a while? I mean, it's it's why? How do you explain that? Um, well, it, it you know people I think basically want to do good. These contractors, yeah, it was probably against their bottom line, um, but they knew it was the right thing to do, and they said very clearly on camera, yeah, let's reopen it. Great, happy to do that. You know, um, they were on board with it. Um, What's, what's frustrating is that, you know, after that, of course, HUD demolished that housing despite, you know, of course, we didn't expect that our little thing would stop that, but we were kind of hoping that it would spark something and, you know, or can, there, there were already protests going on. The, the people who used to live in there had a, an encampment right next to the housing, and um, we were hoping it would build on that and then you know, enough pressure would mount to stop the destruction. That didn't happen, so that, that was incredibly frustrating. But it's kind of led us um, to, to realize that public pressure is really where it's at and what we need to be building right now and trying just to, to get people to take to the streets effectively um, and, and force change to happen. 
You know, we've got, there are some good people in government now, and we need to give them the pressure that they need to oppose the other forces, the other pressure that's coming at yeah. them. So also, we're, as an audience, so familiar with you and your partner doing this um, as the yes men, but you work with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, often, how many people are you normally working with to make some of these events happen? Um, like the Chamber of Commerce event, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the news, this was just Monday where you showed up at the Chamber of Commerce and, and announced that uh, they were reversing their stance on global warming. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> the, the, the Washington Post reported on it, the AP reported on it, everybody took it up on the wire. Yeah. Um, how many people did it take to, to make an event like that happen and, and to record it? Did you record it? Mm, it it's, yeah. Because you were mentioned in all the news pieces. Um, yeah. yeah, we were working with some folks who uh, um, decided to kind of back off and not take credit for it. Um, but there were a lot of people working on it, and um, maybe 15 or so. Um, there, there didn't have to be. There, we could have done it with three, I think, um, but it helped a lot and made it a lot easier um, to have all those people helping. Um, people showed up at the conference, videotaped it, and, and uh, you know, a lot of the effect was just from sending out the press release. But then, of course, having a confrontation in the room meant that it lived in the media and it was on MSNBC and CNN and yeah. all that. Yeah, if you aren't familiar, it, while he was addressing the audience, um, or the, he was at the National Press Club, uh, the actual spokesperson for the Chamber of Commerce came running into the room <laughs> screaming, this man is an imposter. And he shouted back, who are you? You're an imposter. <laughs> and then one of the reporters in the room said, are you an activist? I'm on a deadline. <laughs> it was just fantastic. It was um, amazing. So, uh, but that was like five days in the planning. These people that, that we worked with just thought of the idea, and then you know, the next day they decided not to do it, and the third day they decided to do it, and we wrote the speech and made it happen. Where did you get the logos for the Chamber of Commerce? Didn't you the put Chamber them up on the Commerce? Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Snuck in after hours, you know, took off their logos. <laughs> So I read once that you had mentioned you've never been arrested doing this, but you read about an event like that, which the Post went on to, ex to talk about after the fact as like being one of the most bizarre events they'd ever seen take place. Mm -hmm. um, and, and with this person claiming you're a fake and, and the press club upset with you, is all of this perfectly legal or is nobody just, is everybody so shocked that you can always scamper out before anything happens? Yeah, I mean, there's no immediate police issue. You know, it's not like the police are going to come and see something obviously illegal happening. We're all well dressed. We're behaving roughly in a civil manner to each other. Um, <laughs> the the issue is that they could take us to court, um, sue us, um, all kinds of things. And of course, they could. And they threatened legal action. They've threatened legal action quite publicly. Um, but it's never happened. We've been doing this for ten years, and. We've never gotten any legal action, try as hard as we might. Um, I think they decide that it's just not worth the additional exposure. Um, they couldn't get much out of us. And you know, would, would it really set an example? I don't know. I think it's a, a mixed bag for them. Well, so let's talk about Dow. Um, mm. you've, you have done a lot of actions against Dow. Um, and m most well known is the Bhopal incident where you appeared on BBC World News, mm -hmm. um, which is featured at the beginning of the movie. Um, so Dow, I would imagine, has threatened legal action because of that entire incident, which no, never even threatened. No, never even threatened. Um, there was a rumor in the media after, after we made the stock price plunge um, that the SEC was investigating us for having shorted their stock, supposedly. Um, but, of course, we, we didn't know what we were doing. Um, we didn't know it would plunge, so they, there was no investigation. Yeah, I, I think in the movie, he appears on BBC as, as a spokesperson for Dow, which you saw in the trailer, and the stock plummets. And that is one of the most poignant parts of the whole movie because he's 
saying the DAO is going to do this amazing good, which is sort of like the what happened in New Orleans, where people start feeling great. The, the reporters in Paris, where you were doing that interview, were clapping you on the back and saying, that's amazing. Finally, we get to report good news for a change. And, but the stock plummets, and, and the abuse that DAO took from shareholders for doing something good is yeah. what's the most appalling part of the whole thing. Yeah, and that's sort of the core of that, that part of the movie is, you know, if, if companies <clears throat> did do the right thing, um, they would be punished by the stock market often. I mean, if it went against their bottom line. So actually, in the course of the broadcast, I say this is the first time a company this size has done the right thing just because it's the right thing to do. Because it's really impossible. No matter how good the CEO is um, and how well-intentioned uh, he or she is, it's, it's not going to matter because the shareholders decide. And you know that's why I think targeting companies directly trying to appeal to their better sense is, is really not um, a long-term approach. It's maybe good for getting an issue highlighted and you know pushing towards legislation, but really changing the rules of the game is what we have to do. Um, and that's kind of the point. And so changing the rules of the game, would that be your ultimate goal? Yeah, it's the only thing we have. I mean, we have this thing called democracy and that's all we've got. Um, we can make the laws, we can decide not to let corporations kill 20,000 people and get away with it, um, the way Union Carbide did and Dow bought it and hasn't done anything. We could, we could change those rules, definitely. Well, um, it's, talking about that, I, I also want to talk about the New York Times prank and um, how they were wanting to step up and do something even bigger than the survival ball um, and upping the ante, if you were. And so I think looking at this, like it, it sums up so much of what you guys do because you, you put all this time and energy into a prank like this. And one of the most amazing parts about it is is all of the, the different stories. I mean, it's a full New York Times. You can browse through it and every story is written um, incredibly well and uh, but it gets people thinking and talking and and the scene later in, in this in the movie where people are reading it and they start talking and asking about it it kind of sums up everything that you guys do and it's it's the dialogue and the awareness mm -hmm. about the problems that exist yeah um, that was the the idea the intention was um, really to keep the pressure up after the election. Um, we just banked on Obama winning the election and uh, so when he did, um, 10 days, I think it was seven days later, um, the New York Times came out with a dream edition basically. Um, everything fixed, you know, we, we <laughs> um, <laughs> the war's over and we're building a sane economy and all this great stuff and it was post dated six months in the future. And all the articles um, described how this had happened over the past six months since the election. It was due to massive public pressure, and that's all. Like, um, there's, each story describes how um, our leaders didn't want to do the right thing. Senator so-and-so was on the fence, but, and Obama himself was on the fence, but there was massive public pressure that convinced them to do the right thing. And so the message was really about that, like this enormous movement got Obama elected and now, now what? Yeah. Um, were you at all criticized for this in terms of uh, possibly even making fun of the, the reverential tone that everybody had for Obama and, and that almost naive feeling that everything was gonna be better? No, no, it was a week later, so people had a chance to celebrate. <laughs> we, we thought of doing it two days later, but we thought, no, no, we, we included, we're just so excited. I, I still get shivers thinking of it. But a week later, it's okay, now back to work. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you, um, with, with the New Orleans scene and, and the housing project and the people that were working already being active there who were inspired by the hoax that you had done, and also in Bhopal, it showed you went to India and talked to people in Bhopal about the hoax and the effect that it had on them, mm -hmm. and you talked to people who were working with the survivors of the accident and, and uh, people who were living with the effects. Does the Yes Men work with other groups or do you have a part of your organization that, that 
works with follow-up and works at, at least like main, uh, keeping up to date with progress that's being made on some of these? Yeah, absolutely. Informally, but we do. And, um, you know, we've been in touch with the people in Bhopal and in New Orleans that we worked with. Um, we just actually, when we premiered the film, uh, there were simultaneous premieres in Bhopal, New Orleans, and Calgary, Alberta, where we did the Exxon thing is at the oil conference. And um, it's great. Yeah, I mean, we don't, you know, we're not an organization. We, we try to lend our actions, our, our weird form of comedy to various um, social movements to help them and be helped by them and, you know, just um, get attention for important causes. And we do try to follow up with what's happened, but we're not an NGO either, of course. Right. <laughs> Um, the website's theyesmenfixtheworld.com, and uh, thank you, Andy Bicklebaum. Thank you.